South Korea is in the midst of a very bitter civil war, one that you might not even realize exists. And no, I'm not talking about the conflict with North Korea. Real life lore's office is down the hall, to the right. The civil war I am referring to is the South Korean gender war, a conflict between Korean men, whom the women in this conflict might call male chauvinists or misogynists, and Korean women, whom the men in this conflict might call radical feminists. Now, Mooney, I can hear you say, we have gender war in my country too, why the feminists and the chauvinists are constantly going at it on the internet. South Korea is different. The gender war there has escalated to the point of physical violence, terroristic behavior, and even political upheaval. And the tension in Korea between chauvinists and feminists is so substantial that even the tiniest bump can cause an eruption. This is the story of one such an eruption. A new front in the war between men and women in Korea started over something almost unbelievably trivial. That thing being gacha game art. In case you don't know, gacha games are generally mobile games that implement a randomized vending machine mechanic, or gacha mechanic, so named for the sound a Japanese toy capsule vending machine makes when you turn its crank. In gacha games, you pay in-game currency which can sometimes cost real money and you receive, well, something. That something very often being a character or character skin that you can then use in-game. The very notion that mobile gacha games could lead to political upheaval is absurd. How does a society as sophisticated and wonderful as Korea's arrive at a point where animated waifus can result in terrorism? This conflict has deep, winding roots in Korea, and we're going to try to approach this topic with a nuanced perspective. To do so, we'll explore both current events and historical context, both his story and hers story, in order to understand why little C's can cause such big trouble. But first, a quick word from our returning sponsor, Brilliant. Moon Channel viewers have enthusiastically told me about how Brilliant has worked for them, and so I'm happy to have Brilliant sponsoring another video with us. If you, like me, have a lifelong love of learning, yet often struggle to find the time for wholesome growth, Brilliant might be exactly what you are looking for. Brilliant has thousands of interactive lessons ranging from basic to advanced topics. You can learn math or computer science or data analysis with only 15 minutes of interactive problem solving a day, all presented in bite-sized, low-pressure lessons that are as fun as they are captivating. Try Brilliant free for a full 30 days by clicking on the link provided in the description of the video or by visiting brilliant.org slash moonchannel. If you are one of the first 200 people to sign up, you'll even get 20% off an annual subscription. That's brilliant.org slash moonchannel. Why settle for smart when you could be brilliant? Our story begins in February of 2023 with a small but rapidly growing indie game studio called Project Moon. No relation. If you don't play mobile gacha games, you might know Project Moon from their game's library of Ruina, a card battler somewhat akin to Slay the Spire, and Lobotomy Corporation, a roguelite that plays like a combination between Fallout Shelter and Dwarf Fortress with an SCP Foundation-like setting and a difficulty slider locked to masochistic. Project Moon's earlier games were standouts amongst their competitors for two reasons. The first reason was Project Moon's unique art style, which was simple but very sleek and stylized. The second reason was the lore. Project Moon's games are built around grim but fascinating stories which together create a Project Moon universe of sorts. And so, when Project Moon announced that it was producing a horror role-playing gacha game for mobile devices, there was a surprising amount of enthusiasm. Gacha games are notorious for being cash cows, but usually gacha games are published by big players in the industry like MiHoYo, Psy Games, or Nexon. Creating a gacha game that players will actually enjoy and spend money on is quite an endeavor. It's literally like creating an MMO, not just any team can do it. But Project Moon is not just any team, and they did indeed release their gacha game Limbus Company to very positive reception. Fans of Project Moon were, well, over the moon with Limbus Company, and they promoted it far and wide with whispers of the game's surprising depth and unique art reaching even the dark, festering grottos of Western Gacha Reddit. The Limbus Company exploded in popularity, far exceeding the expectations of Project Moon. I would know I fell for the hype myself and tried it back in early 2023. The game is a little bit like Darkest Dungeon mixed with Project Moon's former game in Library of Ruina, 
which I also happened to play. I determined back then that the game was neat, but too involved for me, I just didn't have the time to play. Evidently, not everyone shared in my sentiments. Limbus Company's player count grew and grew and grew. Prior to Limbus Company's release, Project Moon's highest ever player count for a game was in 2021 when Library of Ruina briefly saw a peak player count of roughly 7,000 players. By April of 2023, Limbus Company reported roughly 260,000 players and a revenue of $1.8 million within just two months of release, as per MMOBite.tv. MMOBite goes on to say that Limbus Company's launch was only a modest one, coming in at 15% of what Eversoul, another gacha game, launched to just three months prior. But Eversoul was published by Kakao Games, which is a subsidiary of Kakao, a South Korean internet giant that reported an annual revenue of $5.89 billion in 2022. Limbus Company taking home 15% of what Eversoul launched to is an extraordinary achievement for an entity as small as Project Moon. However, this smallness, this relative inexperience, came at a cost for Project Moon. Their diehard fans, the ones that had promoted Limbus Company everywhere, knew the score. Their expectations were tempered with the knowledge that Project Moon is a small indie dev, and that problems with the game would be resolved slower than a larger, more experienced dev team might manage. The new players, though, well, they were much less understanding. Gotcha devs are usually from big companies, and those dev teams can gauge the expectations of players more accurately and respond to complaints more quickly than a small, inexperienced indie team like Project Moon can. The new players, missing the context that the old players had, were upset that their expectations were unmet, and that balance changes were slow. But there is another thing that these older players knew that these newer players didn't about Project Moon. Project Moon, you see, has an unstated anti-lewd stance. Their characters can be attractively designed, sure, but they make it a point to avoid egregious fan service, meaning sexualization. And so, when Project Moon announced that Limbus Company would be adding two swimsuit characters for the summer season, the older players weren't expecting anything lewd. But the new players, the overwhelming majority of players, were expecting what every gacha offers for summer swimsuit characters. Fan service. Lots and lots of highly provocative, prurient fan service. One of the two summer characters was a male character named Summer Sinclair. He wore swim trunks, a collar, and not much else. Whereas the female character released was Summer Ishmael, and she wore a skin-tight, diving wetsuit. Ishmael's usual outfit is a suit and tie, and so the wetsuit is quite fan servicey. The skin-tight nature of a wetsuit, the focus on the character's body, it's all heavily sexualized. And this is for a company which has a history of avoiding such sexualization. But this wetsuit was not revealing enough for the new players, who were expecting the usual. What happened next shook the entire Korea gacha game industry to its very core, and the aftershock reverberated into wider Korean society. It started small just some grumblings on various Korean forums by disgruntled players. But these grumblings, like a tiny snowball at the top of a snow-covered mountain, rolled along, collecting additional grievances as they went, each grievance compounding the severity of the last. The wetsuit being insufficiently sexy wasn't just Project Moon keeping to some policy of anti-fan service, no. It was intentional. And it wasn't just intentional, it was malicious. And who was the malicious actor? Who was acting in bad faith to desexualize their gacha games? Well, it must have been a feminist. A radical feminist. Someone purposefully designed Swimsuit Ishmael and the Korean gacha gamers would find out who. The spark is lit, the powder keg fizzling. The event now infamously known as the Ishmael Swimsuit Incident has begun. On August 5th, 1997, Korean Air Flight 801 took off from Seoul en route to Guam. The aircraft, a Boeing 747-300, was in good working order. The pilot was Captain Park Yong chul age 42. Captain Park was previously a pilot in the Korean Air Force and had accumulated a total of 8,932 hours of flight time, roughly two-thirds of which were as a civilian pilot. His first officer was Song Kyung-ho, age 40. He too was previously a pilot in the Korean Air Force, and with over 4,000 hours of flight time under his belt, roughly half of which were as a civilian pilot, First Officer Song was no greenhorn. 
the journey across the Pacific Ocean progressed without any apparent issue. As the flight approached Guam, however, it encountered a storm, which obscured the plane's final destination, Antonio B. Wanpat International Airport, from sight. In aviation lingo, these weather-related problems are called IMCs, Instrument Meteorological Conditions, conditions in which one has to fly by flight instruments instead of utilizing one's sight. You may be familiar with the incident that follows. Perhaps you've already read a version of this story in Malcolm Gladwell's book Outliers. Well, instead of reading anyone else's words to you, let's read the pilot's words together and do a play-by-play. -play. This is the intracockpit communication transcript taken from Appendix B of the National Transportation Safety Board's Aircraft Accident Report. At 1521 UTC, the first officer notifies the captain that the condition at Guam is no good. The captain acknowledges this by stating that it rains a lot. As the descent continues, the first officer asks the captain, don't you think it rains more, in this area here? The captain doesn't respond to the questions. He makes further statements, and the first officer answers simply, yes. At 1526, just five minutes later, the flight engineer notices that something is wrong. He asks about Guam's condition. At 1527, the flight engineer then states, that the weather radar has helped us a lot, to which the pilot responds yes, they are very useful. At 1529, the captain states, we should be getting onto the route, to which the flight engineer responds, it is rising instead. The captain answers in the affirmative, yeah, you are right. 10 minutes later, the first officer discovers that their incoming runway's glide slope instrument landing system appears unresponsive. He appears to make a statement about it, which is then corroborated by the flight engineer, who asks aloud about 30 seconds later, is the glide slope working? Glide slope, yeah? The captain replies yes, yes, it's working. The flight engineer can only utter in response a baffled ah, so. Another voice interrupts, but it's unclear who it is. We can presume it was the captain. He asks if the glide slope is working, to which the first officer replies, not usable. Finally, the captain acknowledges that since today's glide slope condition is not good, we need to maintain 1,440, please set it. An unknown voice, presumably the first officer, replies with a simple yes. The flight engineer jokes that the guy working here probably was a GI in Korea before. Remember this line for later. The captain responds with a simple affirmation. The crew then goes through their landing checks, but about one minute later, the captain asks again, isn't glide slope working? And then notes, wiper on. Nobody responds to his query this time. The flight engineer merely replies, yes, wiper is on. Not even a minute later, the first officer asks, not in sight? The captain replies, oh, yes. The first officer then states, let's make a missed approach. The flight engineer confirms, not in sight. The first officer reciprocates the statement, not in sight, missed approach. The flight engineer says, go around. The captain says, go around, and then, there is silence, save for the ground proximity warning system calling out numbers. 50, 40, 30, 20. At 1.42 Guam local time, Korean Air 801 slams into the side of Nimitz Hill, just three and a half miles away from the airport. Of the 254 people aboard, 229 perish. Let me ask you something about what we just read. Does that conversation seem fitting for an imminent plane crash? Why doesn't the first officer take more direct action? Why doesn't anyone tell air traffic control what is going on? How is it possible that the first officer and flight engineer can directly see what is happening and yet apparently fail to even utter a protest as the captain charges the plane directly into a hillside? The words in the transcript are translated into plain English, but there is an additional layer of context required to understand how this plane crash happened, and that is cultural context. Korean culture is extremely hierarchical, more so than China, more so than even Japan. When the first officer asks the captain, don't you think it rains more in this area here? He is trying to respectfully communicate to his superior, an elder in age with more flight hours, that the area they're in has more rain, and that they should try to avoid it. When the flight engineer chimes in later, stating that the weather radar has helped us a lot, this flight engineer is also trying to relay a suggestion to change course and avoid the weather conditions. 
When the first officer and flight engineer discover the glide slope isn't operational, the first officer mutters something about it, and the flight engineer asks the captain if the glide slope is working. This is a suggestion to the captain that the glide slope is, in fact, not working and that he should check it. But the captain responds that it is working, which is his statement to the flight engineer that the flight engineer needs to keep to his role and have some respect. The flight engineer replies with a baffled, eh, so. Knowing that the captain has realized his disrespect, has issued a condemnation, and has declined to check the glide slope instrument as a measured response to insubordination. The captain, satisfied with the behavior of the first officer and flight engineer, finally checks the glide slope instrument, noting that the condition isn't good, acknowledging the concerns brought up as an order. This communicates that the decision to work around the glide slope is his decision. The flight engineer then makes a joke. The guy working here probably was a GI in Korea before, a grunt. It's a joke punching down the ladder. The glide slope instruments are broken because someone lower in the hierarchy has done lower hierarchy things typical of their status. The captain asks once again if the glide slope is working. Nobody answers, but the situation is growing more and more dire by the moment. Breaking with social protocol and understanding that there will be social consequences, the first officer makes the bold statement, let's make a missed approach, a direct suggestion and not a question. The flight engineer offers his support of the first officer by stating, not in sight. The first officer confirms, not in sight, missed approach. Just before the plane crashes, the flight engineer says, go around, and the captain, finally cracking, acknowledges that he will indeed go around. But it is too late. There is no panic, there are no further words spoken. The aircraft crashes into Nimitz Hill. If you speak, we'll say fluent East Asian or belong to a cultural group that communicates indirectly like this, all of this talk may have already made sense to you the first time around. And for those of you who are disturbed by my translation and find it troublesome, consider this. The NTSB in its executive summary of the incident determined that the probable cause of the Korean Air Flight 801 accident was the captain's failure to adequately brief and execute the non-precision approach and the first officer's and flight engineer's failure to effectively monitor and cross-check the captain's execution of approach. I told you that story in order to illustrate how Korean men treat each other. South Korea is an extremely hierarchical society, more so than in Japan, more so than in China. One's age, status, family, and gender determine one's role in society. Although Korea offers the appearance of a politically progressive, modernized country, Underneath the veneer of glitz and glam, beneath the Innisfree toner, there exists a deeply conservative society. You might be familiar with the Japanese system of honorifics. In Japan, the more neutral honorific san is commonly used to address a hierarchical equal, or an individual whom you are not yet familiar with, akin to Mr. or Miss. You say their name followed by san, muni-san. Sama is used when you're addressing someone of a higher status than you, akin vaguely to sir or madam. Sensei is used for teachers or people of scholarly learning. I sometimes jokingly call my youngest sister Pearly Saba, Saba in this case meaning mackerel. Although honorifics are widely used, there are many informal situations in which Japanese people don't use honorifics. A teacher addressing a student, for example, is a social dynamic in which one sometimes might not use an honorific. In your own group of close friends or towards your immediate family, you might also elect not to use honorifics as it feels natural to do so amongst the people you're most comfortable with. But it is not this way in Korea. In South Korea, the use of honorifics even in informal situations is quite normal. If you spend any amount of time living in Korea and getting to know Korean people, inevitably you will be asked how old you are as your age is critically important in determining the deference you are expected to provide to other people and the deference you receive even amongst your friends you might not even use a person's first name out of deference. In a friend group, every older male is hyung if you are male or oppa if you are female. Both words translate roughly to older brother. If you have any Korean friends who have moved from Korea to your non-Korean country, you might have noticed that it's very hard to get them to break the habit of hyunging and oppaing. The expectations of hierarchy in Korea are very strict, even by East Asian standards. Why is that? How did this happen? And what does any of this have to do with gender wars and gacha games? Well, my friends, this has everything to do with gender wars and gacha games. But before we dive further 
into the history and the context. Let's go back for a moment to our gacha drama. Ishmael's wetsuit was completely contrary to the expectations of the Korean gacha game community. This is not a true summer skin, they said. This is a joke. This is a prank. This is a malicious act. It has to be. The wetsuit design couldn't possibly be the work of a man. After all, no self-respecting Korean man would make something this subservient to the interests of feminists, especially not an artist who works on gacha art, right? As such, this artist must be a woman, and unlike other gacha artist women who happily draw what they are told to draw, or better yet, are expected to draw, this woman has bucked the status quo. We are on the lookout for a feminist. And not just a feminist, but a radical, a revolutionary. How else could this wetsuit art have ever happened? Each allegation was more severe than the last, and blown out of proportion, often with the intention merely to troll and none of the accusations were backed up by any evidence other than assumption. The players demanded action against this radical feminist, and so they sought her out. Who is the artist in charge of these character CGs? Where is she? Well, she turned out to be a he. The designer of wetsuit Ishmael and the artist were both men. Disillusioned and perhaps slightly embarrassed, the angry mob dissolved. The artist in question isn't a woman and thereby isn't a feminist. He's just some guy with bad taste. But this was not the end, as people were still angry about the outfit itself. It was about who the developers seemed to be prioritizing. They were listening to women on Twitter and not to the men who were actually playing their game and giving them money. The incident had been caught up in the larger Korean gender war. Well, if the mob could not find a witch, they would make one. And their target was a different Limbus Company artist who goes by the alias Vel Mori. Velmori was a story illustrator at Limbus Company, but she did not design wetsuit Ishmael. In fact, by all accounts, Velmori had absolutely nothing to do with wetsuit Ishmael whatsoever. But Velmori is a woman, and Velmori had some history. Deleted retweets of a half-decade-old archive from long before she had started working for Project Moon. So the angry mob had found its target, a vent for their frustrations, a cog in the machine not performing as it's supposed to. A woman who happened to be an artist working for Limbus Company, who had many years prior retweeted and then subsequently deleted a handful of feminist tweets. Even if she had nothing to do with the wetsuit, the mob argued, her radical feminism warranted her termination as per Project Moon's own stated policies. The usual internet witch hunt behavior ensued. Project Moon developers received death threats and their games were review bombed into oblivion. But the situation escalated. More accusations poured in concerning Velmori's involvement in radical feminism, and as the anger boiled over, a group of Limbus Company players went to Project Moon's physical offices and issued their demands, refusing to leave until they were able to talk directly to the developers themselves. And for reasons unknown, Project Moon's developers caved and allowed the protesters into their physical offices. It was there that the protesters allegedly gave the Project Moon team a list of their demands, and allegedly also issued threats of physical violence. Not long after the angry mob departed, Project Moon released a statement on Twitter apologizing to its players for many different issues including technical errors, performance bugs, unintended nerfs, and more. The initial statement received a follow-up statement from Project Moon's director, which appeared to fire Velmori due to her ideology and confirmed that Velmori's artwork would no longer be featured in the game. A victory for the boys. We got everything we wanted out of our capital riot, including the burning of our witch. Sure, we have to endure that wetsuit skin, but maybe in the future we'll get some looter skins now that the devs know who is in charge. But alas, this was no victory. The firing of Velmori changed everything. The wider world became exposed to this story and was not at all sympathetic to the plight of the Korean male gacha gamers. Even when the situation was presented in its most favorable light to casual observers, their behavior seemed preposterous, immature, and entitled. In enforcing their demands on Project Moon, the gacha gamer men had fallen into a trap. Velmori became a martyr. The hierarchical systems in Korea that exist today have ancient roots. These hierarchical systems began, arguably, as Confucianism crept into Korean politics and culture 
vis-a-vis -vis China, starting as early as 372 AD with the founding of the Confucian Taihak School in the Kingdom of Goguryeo, and continuing through the Unified Silla period in the year 682, which saw the founding of the Gukhak School. Confucian schools like these became the preeminent places of learning in Korea, and Confucianism established itself as a dominant philosophy in Korea second only at the time to Buddhism. The influence of Buddhism in Korea reached its apex during the Goryeo dynasty, not to be confused with Gogoryeo. But later Goryeo kings, such as King Sunjong, seeing Confucianism's centralizing power, suppressed the practice of Buddhism in favor of Confucianism. This trend then exploded during the Joseon dynasty, where Confucianism was elevated to the official ideology of the state. But the Confucianism that the Joseon dynasty adopted was of a very specific school known as Neo-Confucianism. Now, Neo-Confucianism developed in part as a retort to Buddhism, which had also become the dominant ideology in Tang China, just as it was in Korea and Japan. This is going to be an extreme simplification, but where Buddhism teaches self-cultivation for the individual purpose of enlightenment, Neo-Confucianism purports that self-cultivation should not merely be a means to individual enlightenment, but also a mechanic by which one can contribute to a harmonious society. It's not just you, it's not just me, it's us, and we must achieve harmony together. Now, Neo-Confucianism had a lot of benefits for China and Korea. It was a more rational ideology than Buddhism, and its focus on the practical matter of statesmanship as opposed to personal spiritual enlightenment led to the establishment of more schools of learning as opposed to temples of worship, and the uplifting of ethics as a guiding principle of family and government. But Neo-Confucianism was not without its drawbacks, and issues in the underlying philosophy of Neo-Confucianism led to subsequent reformist thinkers such as Yang Mingzi, who developed, for example, the philosophical principle of I think therefore I am over a century prior to René Descartes. Yang Mingzi is considered one of the great masters of Confucianism in China and Japan. It's even been said that Yang Mingzi's teachings heavily inspired the Japanese philosophy of Bushido. But these reforms never really made it to Korea, and Yang Mingzi does not hold the same prestige in Korea as he does in China or Japan. Why? Well, it's because the Korean state threw itself wholeheartedly into Neo-Confucianism, so much so that it developed its own independent schools of Neo-Confucian thought, separate from what was emerging in China. Where China had Yang Mingzi, Korea had Yi Huang, known better perhaps as Togye, and Yi Yi, also known as Yulgok. Togye and Yang Mingzi were contemporaries. They lived at the same time period, the early 1500s. If you watched the video I made on Christian games, do you recall how American Calvinists, Puritans, were so deeply entrenched in their beliefs that their Calvinism failed to develop as Dutch Calvinism did? How American Protestantism branched away from Protestantism at large and thus failed to develop Neo-Calvinist theology as a counterweight to Calvinist Puritanism. Korean Neo-Confucianism developed very much in that same vein, as Ming Dynasty China evolved its Neo-Confucianism, thereby arguably softening the strict hierarchical systems that come with Neo-Confucianism. Korea doubled down. Hyun Sun Lee, a lecturer at the Department of Philosophy at Seoul National University, states in his work, Yi Huang and Yi Yi's interpretation of the Taiji Tu Su, focusing on their theories of Li Qi, quoting the traditional work Annals of the Joseon Dynasty. Yi Huang took to heart that China lost its tradition of Dohak or authentic Neo-Confucianism. In other words, Yi Huang, the preeminent Korean Neo-Confucianist scholar, utterly rejected Chinese developments and ideology in favor of a pure Neo-Confucianism. You may have noticed that I never described what Neo-Confucianists actually believe outside of their emphasis on hierarchy, and I haven't done this because it wouldn't make any sense to you at all. It's like trying to read and understand Hegel before reading Kant, but worse by a factor of centuries. Let me read you a snippet from the article we just discussed to give you an example. Zhu Xi claims that the Wuji and the Taiji are not separate things. He interprets the above phrase as formless but with a Li, and describes it as the substance what is above form. Skipping ahead. Uh, whereas the Wuji and the Taiji mean the same thing, the Taiji and the Ying Yang are to be clearly distinguished. In other words, they are explained as belonging, respectively, to Li and Qi. I'll stop there, you get it. I haven't explained Neo-Confucianism in full because I can't, but what I can tell you 
is that Neo-Confucianism puts an enormous emphasis on hierarchy as a stabilizing force of societal harmony. Yi Huang, the Korean master we discussed, who felt that Ming China had lost true Neo-Confucianism, was himself critiqued by Yi Yi, also known as Yul Go. Yi Yi felt that a more physical, more material approach to Confucianism was necessary. Self-cultivation, knowing oneself, one's place, one's capacities, are directly relevant to proper administration. In other words, Yi Yi's teachings deepened the physical bonds between the state and Confucianism. Not unlike in Japan and China, a rigid social hierarchy emerged in Korea, a caste system of sorts, in which the king sat on top followed by civil leaders and military officers, then learned peoples, laborers, etc. Unlike China and Japan, however, this system was more rigid in its execution. This formal system was abolished in 1894, but the underlying hierarchical nature of Korean society was deeply embedded into the Korean psyche. And unlike in China or Japan, there would be no uprooting of this hierarchical system through a century of conflict with the West. China had the Opium Wars and the self-strengthening movement and the Boxer Rebellion and much more, which did a lot to reduce the influence of Confucianism over China. And much of that on the Chinese side was intentional attempts to westernize. Likewise, in Japan, you had Commodore Perry, the Boshin War, the Meiji Restoration, etc., which eroded the influence of Confucianism in Japan. But you will note, of course, that Confucianism was never eradicated. Strict adherence to Confucian hierarchy and customs remains in both China and Japan to this day. One of these countries is literally communist, and yet still has Confucian hierarchical values built into its society. Korea is both the most historically Confucian state, while also having had the least erosion of that Confucianism through external or internal intervention. And it was Japan, and not a Western power, that interfered most in Korea's modern cultural development. Although Korea itself was arguably forced out of its isolationism by, surprise surprise, the United States. Uh, let me explain. The Koreans called Shinmyangyo, the Western disturbance during the Shimi year. In 1866, an American merchant ship called the SS General Sherman steamed up the Taedong River and attempted to illegally force the Koreans to trade. After some miscommunication and ignored demands, the Koreans dispatched a naval contingent to destroy the American ship and execute the sailors aboard in a punitive mission, as the Koreans thought that the American ship was actually a French ship. Look, it's a long story. The naval contingent was like something out of Age of Empires II nine fire ships and a turtle ship. This fleet successfully brought down the SS General Sherman and the sailors were captured by civilians on the shore and executed. A few years later, in 1871, the Americans dispatched a small fleet to investigate the missing SS General Sherman. The Koreans had a strict law at the time that no foreign ships could sail up the Han River. The Americans requested access to the Han River to ostensibly investigate the General Sherman. And when the Koreans said no, the Americans peacefully and cooperatively turned around and left. No, just kidding. Of course, the Americans ignored the order and steamed up the Han River. The Koreans opened fire but didn't do much damage, perhaps intentionally so. The US then demanded an apology for violating Korea's sovereignty, as is tradition. The United States gave the Koreans 10 days to apologize, and when they didn't, because why would they, the Americans opened fire and moved to capture the fortress of Gwanseong Garrison. After a substantial naval bombardment, the Americans deposited roughly 650 sailors and marines who marched on the fortress, capturing it. The Americans fielded the Remington Rolling Block Carbine. The Koreans fought back with primitive matchlocks. At the end of the conflict, the Americans had suffered 3 killed and 10 wounded, and had killed 243 people by the American estimate, and around 350 people by the Korean estimate. The Americans then attempted to persuade the Koreans to negotiate again for trade, which they naturally declined. As Korean reinforcements began to arrive, the U.S. fleet, realizing it was outgunned, left for China on July 3rd. But the brazen American attack had inspired a nearby rising power. A power that was trying to copy Western tactics and technology and ideology as much as it possibly could. That power being Japan. Japan, inspired by the American attack and remembering how their own isolation was forcibly ended by American warships, approached Ganghua Island with its military in 1876 in order to purposefully provoke a Korean response, before then issuing a blockade of the region with their navy and demanding an unequal trade treaty under these familiar terms, 
ones that they learned from their own encounter with the United States. Give us what we want or be subject to incredible violence. And the Koreans complied, signing the first of many unequal treaties with Japan. This unequal treaty paved the way for other nations to force trade upon Korea, and before long, just like in China, just like in Japan, modernization in Korea came into direct conflict with traditional Confucian systems of government. But unlike in China or Japan, that process was cut fatally short. Tensions were rising between China and Japan, and the consequences of massive trade inflow through unequal treaties in Korea had led to political turmoil and famine. In Korea proper, the conflict between Neo-Confucians and the uncontrolled influx of Western values and technology was also reaching a fever pitch, which erupted into the Donghak Peasant Revolution. Donghak means Eastern learning. It was part religion, part Neo-Confucianist school, and it directly opposed Seohak, meaning Western learning. King Gojong, the last king of the Joseon dynasty, requested aid from China to suppress the rebellion. The Japanese, fearing that they would lose influence, sent their own soldiers without Korea's consent. As the rebellion came to an end, Korea demanded the immediate departure of Japanese soldiers, which the Japanese refused. In July of 1894, Japan made its move, occupying the royal palace in Seoul and taking King Gojong prisoner. Before July had even ended, the Japanese had replaced members of the Korean government with pro-Japanese puppets. The Sino-Japanese War was about to begin, and the Russo-Japanese War loomed over the horizon, but the annexation of Korea by Imperial Japan was already underway. Korea did not get to experience a Meiji restoration or a self-strengthening movement from beginning to end, as it simply didn't have the time. The American attack occurred in 1871, the Japanese forcing open Korea occurred in 1876, and by 1894, less than 20 years after being forced open for trade, Korea was already under threat of annexation by Japan. In the year 1910, Japan formalized its annexation of Korea with the signing of the Japan-Korea Annexation Treaty. The Japanese occupation of Korea was brutal. The suffering of the Korean people, unimaginable. The horrors of the occupation are beyond the scope of this video, but I'll leave some reading in the description for you if you'd like to learn more. One of the most grotesque of Japan's inflictions upon Korea was the systematic eradication of Korean culture. The Japanese banned the Korean language, replacing it with Japanese. They attempted to eliminate the use of Korean names. They tried to change the very fabric of Korean history so as to assimilate the Korean people more easily. But as is evident, the Japanese did not succeed in eradicating Korean culture. The Japanese attempt at cultural eradication actually caused the Koreans to entrench their culture to preserve it by any means necessary. As such, Korean culture thrives to this very day, brighter than ever, with each Korean generally quite proud of his or her cultural heritage and eager to share it with the world. Just as Korean culture at large survived Japanese annexation, however, so too did Korean Neo-Confucianism. And although the influence of this Neo-Confucianism deteriorated very substantially under Japanese rule, it was never completely quashed. For all of their imperialism and westernization, the Japanese imperial government was deeply hierarchical, with its own legitimacy tied inseparably to Bushido. You will recall that Neo-Confucianist philosophy had a lot of influence on Bushido. Bushido built upon the foundations of Neo-Confucianism, and Imperial Japan was built on Bushido. As such, Neo-Confucianism, and specifically Korean Puritan Neo-Confucianism, became deeply internalized in Korea to a much greater extent than it did in China or Japan. Citing here the Rootledge Handbook on East Asian Politics, South Koreans believe their country not only as closer to China than Japan, but in administrative culture and familism more Confucian than China. And indeed, in post-war Korea, this strict adherence to hierarchy was utilized in a big way to rein in the people and resolve the chaos of the post-war era. Quoting here from the book Economic Development and the Republic of Korea, proper order between senior and junior and loyalty to the state was used to be utility for the maintenance of parks, referring to South Korean President Park Chung-hee's autocratic political regime. To summarize what we've just discussed succinctly, citing again from Economic Development in the Republic of Korea, Despite their efforts at modernization, 
This movement, referring to modernizing, was cut short by Japan's expansion into the peninsula, which ended with Korea becoming a colony of Japan. Only during the second half of the 20th century were leaders such as President Park Chung-hee able to put into practice on a massive scale some of these practical values inherent in Confucian ethics. In this body of Neo-Confucian ethics, anchored as it is in the Korean psyche, purposefully utilized by the South Korean government to unify and harmonize the people of South Korea, there are two crucial elements we need to extract in order to understand the Korean gender war. We've already discussed them in passing, but let's make them as clear as possible. Number one is the firm adherence to a system of hierarchy, and number two is an emphasis on uniformity and harmony. The system works and is harmonious if we all adhere to the system of hierarchy and we each do our part in the functioning of the state. The key to understanding Korea's gender war is in how the post-war South Korean government leveraged these two elements of Neo-Confucianism to build the modern hierarchy of Korean society and the consequences this has had on the Korean people. Korea today is very different than how it used to be. There's no more emperor and no more imperial court. Korea technically still has an imperial royal family, but they have no power and no formal title. The hierarchy is fundamentally different, and we'll see how the post-war South Korean government, with a little help from the United States, built a new hierarchy with a new emperor at the top. On Twitter, on Tumblr, on Reddit and beyond, the call to war rang out. Once again, Project Moon received threats. Their games were review bombed, and Val Mori's defenders poured out of the woodwork. They came from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, from America and Brazil and Japan. A local union organization, the Gyeonggi Youth Union, published a statement denouncing Project Moon, calling the firing unjust disciplinary action via censorship, a statement which also served as a veiled legal threat. The union also published separate statements addressed to the governor of Gyeonggi, where Project Moon is based, and yet another statement to Project Moon's investors, Dev Sisters Ventures. The IT union, a different union, also issued statements condemning Project Moon. Interested parties staged signage truck protests, in which trucks bearing brightly lit LED signs drove nonstop around Project Moon's physical headquarters during business hours, with messages demanding answers and justice for Val Mori. So fierce, in fact, was the backlash to Project Moon's decision that the story even made its way to the Korean national news. Things were moving quickly and snowballing out of control. The Project Moon announcement occurred on July 25th. The youth union's statement was issued on July 26th, the very next day. The story broke the national news on July 28th, just three days later, and by August 3rd, not even one week later, the youth union held a press conference in which it urged government action against Project Moon and viciously condemned their decision. On that same day, August 3rd, Project Moon broke its silence and issued another statement. In that statement, director Kim Ji-hoon apologizes to the worker who was harmed and issues himself a carefully worded statement, pursuant to very apparent legal consultation. Kim states that this was not a case of ideological investigation or unjust firing. The decision was made based on legal judgment and advice. The statement then went on to claim that various organizations, the media, and people were spreading and repeating false information based on circumstantial evidence, and that no such ideological investigation or unjust firing occurred. The statement also appears to threaten defamation lawsuits if such rumor-mongering continued. The conflict escalated further, but largely out of the public eye. Velmori, it turns out, may not have actually been fired at all. It was just a ploy to protect her, or so the rumors went. But then, on September 18th, 2023, Project Moon issued a statement claiming that Velmori voluntarily left as per her own wishes and in her preferred manner. That same day, the Young E Youth Union published its own statement, retracting its prior statements denouncing Project Moon's unfair dismissal and all of its protests against their investors. They had allegedly confirmed via communications with Project Moon that Velmori was not, in fact, unjustly fired, and that Project Moon did indeed take the appropriate actions. In other words, no labor laws were allegedly broken. The swimsuit incident faded into obscurity. The initial parties all too confused about what happened to actually care enough to continue fighting. 
there were other battlefields anyhow that required their attention. The situation as of this video is ongoing, but rather quiet. On November 8th, 2023, Project Moon allegedly filed criminal charges against the PM User Association, labor unions, and their representatives related to this controversy. The PM User Association was a player-run organization ostensibly made to protest the ideological policing of Project Moon, which has since dissolved and reorganized as the Korea Game Consumers Association. The results of these charges have yet to be realized. The Ishmael wetsuit incident ended without a conclusive, decisive battle. There was no resolution, nor will there be one. Maybe the former PM User Association will be nuked from orbit by Project Moon's lawyers, but maybe not. The youth union will probably settle. Everyone's moved on, but absolutely no progress was made. Ishmael's wetsuit still exists. Her outfits remain conservative. The game remains less lewd by design. Velmori was still either fired or departed on her own terms, which we know from the Japan video also often just simply means fired. There was yelling, accusing, screaming, trucks driving in circles, morning news broadcasts, and now lawsuits. For what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But social harmony has been restored, at least for a time, and ultimately, it is social harmony that matters most of all. This is part one of a two-part video on the Korean gacha drama and gender war. We discussed a lot of history in this video and set the stage of understanding. In part two, the gacha stakes get higher as an old wound in existing tensions ignites an even greater crisis. We'll also take a closer look in the next video at how miserable both women and men are in South Korea, how this came to be, and finally, why the Korean gender war is fought so bitterly and the gacha game community in particular. I've been your host, Mooney. Thank you for watching Moon Channel, and please stay tuned for part two.